Uh, it's Dr. Ian Lake. Um, I just want to share with you today what I've learned about um, insulin, really, as a result of changing my diet to become low carbohydrate, almost ketogenic levels. I've been low carb now for four years, and I, I, it, it's surprising how much you notice um, in the body's metabolism when you actually reduce the noise of the carbohydrate. Because carbohydrate causes a lot of noise, and we inject insulin to cover the carbohydrate, and we mask a lot of subtleties. So I'm hoping to share some of those with you later on. Because, because I, I think we need to prioritize our management of type 1, and a lot of people do, uh, around eating, to, to eating enough, uh, to, sorry, injecting enough insulin for your metabolic needs at that time and not eating food and covering that with insulin. I think there's a difference in that, and, and it's very important. Because I think there's a lot of trouble caused if you're just going to shoot up insulin um, as if it doesn't matter. We have to, I think that has consequences. Um, I've called this respecting insulin, and I don't want, I want that to respect to be in the sort of uh, urban slang sort of, you know, a bit out of date probably, but, you know, the urban slang sort of, uh, we respect it because we, we love it, really, and it's not respected because you fear it. Uh, and I just want to make that clear, really. I'm not trying to make people frightened of insulin. I'm trying to help them to understand it as far as I understand it, and I'm hoping some of the people in here may contribute to that. Um, I'm not telling people to stop using insulin, and I'm not promoting a eating disorder. Okay, but I am going to talk a little bit about low-carbohydrate diets. And that should satisfy my Twitter friends. Um, <laughs> everyone gets them, don't they? Um, so even though insulin is an absolutely necessary and life-saving hormone for people with type 1, I think more is good. Sorry, enough is good, but more I don't think means better, and I think more probably means worse. And... Trudy had some great slides. Um, I wish I had those. I've got static slides. But, but she talks a lot about hyperinsulinemia, and I, I want to touch on that as, as, as a type 1, um, because um, we'll talk about that later. And the evidence is, at the moment, the current evidence is that this is 50 years of, of, of good quality evidence from any study you want to Google, that if you have type 1 diabetes, it's pretty inevitable at some point that you're going to get complications of that condition. Um, and the most important predictor of that is the length of time you've had the disease. So that's not looking good. But it has also been shown that the lower your level of long-term control or your HbA1c, which is a blood test, the, more like, the less likely you are to get complications. So there's a little bit of hope there, and, and that's what our whole management is based on, isn't it? Reducing the HbA1c primarily. Um, and also, <laughs> type 1 diabetes also reduces life expectancy, so just to cheer us all up before, before lunch. And, and, and it's, it can be quite a number of years, uh, as we know, but I don't really want to go into that too much. Uh, and for acute complications, it, it's, they, they, they are frequent, but not necessarily as frequent as, as we imagine. I, I think they're more frequent and we never hear about them in hospitals. I think diabetic ketoacidosis, a lot of people probably approaching that and, and save themselves just through their sheer experience. But if you manage to get yourself into hospital, you've only got a, a, a tiny percent, 0.16% chance of, of, of having that. Um, a lot of people, are, unfortunately, uh, don't survive DKA and, and they might try to manage themselves at home or probably don't even know they're having it which is a bit of a worry, but we do know that the lower the HbA1c, again, the, more, the less likely you are to have uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. So that's worth thinking about. It's all to try to drive the control to become, to become better, isn't it? Um, I couldn't find much on death certificates that were signed with hypoglycemia as the cause, but all I could really find was that if you have more hypos, you're probably more likely to die uh, at some point of, of probably cardiovascular disease or, or you know, arrhythmias or something, dead in bed syndrome, um, which all those old blokes are going to come to at some point. Um, and the long-term complications, um, heart disease, the, this is from the um, National Diabetes Audit from 2016-17, I think. You're three and a half to four and a half times more likely to have a stroke or a heart attack if you have type 1 diabetes with the current management practice. 
And as you can see from that graph, the graph on the left is type 1s and the graph on the right is people without type 1. Um, the good news for that is that if you can get yourself to 80, you actually buck the trend. So you're less likely to have, um, have a hypo, have, have a heart attack. But unfortunately, most of us don't get there because about five to ten years earlier, we're having our heart attacks early. So that's not good. And the lower your HbA1c, the less likely to heart you are to have a heart attack or a stroke. And that carries on right down into the normal range. Um, there's one paper I read, I can't, re I can't quote it, but if you take the normal range of HbA1c from, what, 32, 33 to 42, um, if you take the, if you look at the number of heart attacks within that age within that range of HbA1c, if you take the top fifth of the range of HbA1c, 75% of those heart attacks happen in that top fifth. It's, it's, so there's something going on with, with HbA1c, therefore insulin, and, and, and therefore probably glucose, and that's probably your, your thin on the outside, fat on the inside people. So you know we're not. We have to respect um, sugar and insulin. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide because the number of people achieving uh, the NICE guideline target, and that is an arbitrary target, uh, which is a pragmatic balance between uh, hypoglycemia and complications, uh, is only between 3 and 6%. The REPOSE trial down on the left here, that, that was a big study done in the UK, and they weren't looking for um, HbA1c which was really good because that meant you could actually um, find out information that, that wasn't being loaded. Uh, and only 3% of their population who had a full Daphne, they, they were pampered with, with, with pumps and all sorts of things, only 3% were achieving the HbA1c of um, 48 millimoles per mole. And up on the top right there, the uh, National Diabetes Audit figures again. If you look right at the bottom of the picture on, on the left, that shows the number of people achieving target of... And it's about 6%, isn't it, something like that. So 94% of people with type 1 diabetes in England and Wales are failing to meet even a modest target. And, you know, that's not brilliant, is it? And, and, and this is the same for Australia. That's the one at the, at the bottom there. They've set their definition of normal, I suppose the green, a little bit wider uh, to include 7.5%. And, of course, we do know that there are people who do really, really well. I was at a, a GP practice the other day. I met a, a lady who'd had diabetes type 1 for 57 years, and she had no complications whatsoever. She had a slightly raised HG1C, about 7.5, and was thriving. So it does happen. But the problem is, isn't it, when we all go to our clinics with rubbish results, <laughs> You get hammered. You say, well, well, Mrs. Smith can do it. What's, what's the, your problem? You know, why don't you learn to count carbohydrates and, and just balance it with insulin? You know, lots of people can do it. You can't do it. So I was reasonably well controlled for quite a few years. And then in the, in the few years before I decided to go keto, you know, other things took priority in my life. And for five years in a row, I was just sent to the dietitian to learn how to count carbs and, and how to inject <laughs> insulin. And it, it, you feel quite ashamed as a doctor for, for doing that. And, 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 um, but it's very difficult sometimes to, to balance carbs and insulin in that way. Um, and I, I think this, this sense of inevitability of diabetic complications is holding back the development of, of uh, the rolling out of, of, of pumps, to, of uh, meters to everyone, the CGMs. Um, I think this is attitude, well, we're spending enough on you guys anyway, and you're not going to get any better, so why should we spend a whole shed load more money at an earlier stage? And even though there's 20% access now for tight ones, which is great, I think there's an 80% restriction of, of uh, CGMs to tight ones. I think it, it would make the biggest difference, I think, to a tight one's life to know where they are at any one moment in time. But look here. So we've talked a lot about reducing HbA1c, and... 97% of people achieve that modest target of 48 millimoles per mole on a very low carbohydrate diet, and they can maintain that over two and a half years. And that's the study of the type 1 grit community, which is, which is obviously a whole load of N equals 1s. 97% um, is amazing. And that's the study. And if you, had a, if you had a top 11 to field, I mean, they'd be pretty well in that top 11, wouldn't they, for, for low-carb advocates? And that was published in that journal um, under David Ludwig's name. And um, I, th I, th I think we have to take that seriously, but we have to approach that with caution, as these guys did. 
because they're advocates of low-carb diet. They're, they're not trying to sort of um, be cautious. Well, they're trying to be cautious as scientists, but they're, they're, they're advocates of low-carb. I mean, Richard Bernstein's in there. Um, and, I mean, if, if you're a type 1, you look at the top sentence, and if you're, if you're somebody setting the guidelines, you'll probably look at the bottom sentence. So exceptional control is... Uh, without high levels of acute complications. In fact, the acute complications will reduce the, the hypos and the, and the diabetic ketoacidosis. That will reduce with, with a low-carb diet. Uh, and and that, this diet is 38 grams of carbs per day, so it, is, it comes into the sort of very low-carb ketogenic type of diet. Uh, but, 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 but the generalizability of these findings and long-term safety of carbohydrate restriction remains unknown. And, you know, Richard Bernstein is our only hope at the moment. He's had diabetes for decades, and uh, he had complications and reversed them with a ketogenic diet. And I think that gives us hope, because he's not like that other lady I talked about who'd had diabetes for 50-odd years and had no complications at all. So he's, he's probably, he's, there's probably something in that. And here's Jessica Turton, uh, who also... Um, has sympathies with low carbohydrate. She, she did an amazing sort of uh, trawl through all the research to try to make any sense of the current evidence for type 1 diabetes. She only managed to find nine studies which she could include. Um, and some of them, one of them was Richard Bernstein's sort of N equals 1 sort of testimony. Some of them were case reports from hospitals. Some of them were studies, like the good studies from Nielsen in, in Sweden in 2012. Uh, who showed that HbA1c reduction is very possible. With, and the lower the carbs, the better it is. Um, but, but, but even here, they, they decided that they were unable to conclusively determine whether significant differences in type 1 diabetes outcome exist between low and high-carbohydrate diets. They just haven't got the data. And the existing body of evidence is limited and more studies are needed. Well, I'd agree with that. I mean, I've done very, very well out of low-carb ketogenic diet. And, but I don't know what the future holds because there's no evidence to suggest it may be that nobody improves their complication rate. But based around what we know, the chances are people might. And there are multiple anecdotes. Everybody with type 1 who's on low carb has got a blog, probably. And, and certainly everyone's contributed to some Facebook forum. And that's great because you can get a huge amount of information from these people. And these people should be really included in guideline um, assessments, I think. But, you know, N equals 1s, we're all, we're all N equals 1s here, aren't we? Um, and this is a bit of the problem. We're all looking to make the jigsaw up so we can make sense of it all. And, you know, when we put that final piece in that jigsaw and, and stand back and look at it, that piece makes yet another piece of yet another jigsaw. And we all know that. And that is the great thing about science, isn't it? That's what makes getting up so worthwhile to, to think, well, how can we get the next piece of the jigsaw in? And everyone in here will contribute one piece of that jigsaw, and every single person has got something to contribute. And that's the great thing about these meetings, that we're all sharing information, and, and our learning is accelerated by meetings like this. But, you know, it doesn't help for people to make decisions. People find it difficult to make decisions on, on, on whether or not they can accept uh, rec to recommend low-carb diets. And it's unlikely that we're going to get anything from the top anytime soon, based around what I've said. Um, so what do we do as type 1s who are waiting for the evidence? Are we going to sit back for another 20 years? It's going to take 20 years to get enough data to say, well, it's probably going to be okay for the long term. So I, I think we have to provide the information for type 1s, which a lot of people are doing, and, and it's for them to make their own minds up. But I think the information has to get out there. Because type 1 diabetes is not protective against any other type of diabetes. You know, everybody thinks, oh, we've got type 1. That's special. Special people, they're, they, you know, don't handle them because they might actually go hyper at any moment. And God, I haven't got any glucose tablets on me to, to sort it out. And, and if you've got type 1, it doesn't mean you can't get type 2. What if you've got a strong family history of type 2? You may have the genetic makeup that's going to give you type 2. What if you're injecting shed loads of insulin, which is thought to be causing insulin resistance? That, I think that will probably give you type 2. You know, get type 1, get type 2 for free, sort of thing. It's that sort of thing, isn't it? <laughs> so what are the strategy options at the moment? Well, for acute complications, we're managing acute complications all the time. We say, well, eat what you like. That's the Daphne model. Um, we'll tell you how to work out your carbohydrate um, injections, your, sorry, your insulin estimation, and then you can inject that amount of insulin, inject it at the right time, 
after, before you've eaten your carbohydrates and just make sure you don't go hypo, make sure you don't get DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, and you should be okay. And if you can't do it, we will send you back to the district nurse or the practice nurse to, to show you how to do it properly in the diabetic nurse. Uh, it's sort of a hedonistic approach, you know, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll, you know, try your best sort of short-term approach. And the chronic complications, well, we know that the people do die of heart attacks and, we, and, and the chronic complications at the moment are being managed with, with pharmaceuticals. We're, we're, we're sort of saying to people, well, you know, you go go on statins, guys, because you're going to have a heart attack at some point. You know, um, better get your blood pressure under control, which is fair enough, of course, but we get it under control with medication. We'll reduce your complications of heart attack with medication, and, and, and this, is, this is what we're putting up with all the time. And we're crossing our fingers, aren't we, and hoping for the best. And, and we're knowing that we can get sort of Margaret and people through to their 60 years, and we're saying, well, the rest of you, you know, we'll do as best, you can do as best as you can, but every year you turn up to your annual review, it's damage a limitation. We'll see how well you've got away with it this year. So when you go for your retinal screening, you know, oh my God, am I going to have to have my eyes lasered this month or, or, or this year or not? It, it's, it puts a lot of pressure on people with type 1, and that's why there's a significant amount of depression in people with type 1 diabetes. And I think we're basing our management strategy on the wrong thing. We, we've got into this idea that, oh, we've got really good sexy insulins now, so, so let's uh, use those wisely around diet. So I'll bless these little poor little people. They're not allowed to have donuts. So I tell you what, we've got really good insulins now, so we'll, we'll, we'll say, I'll bless you. Have a donut then, and then you can inject your insulin. and, and you know, we'll manage it for you, because you're just the same as the rest of us, really. But we're not, are we? But we are, but we're not, if you see what I mean. We've got different metabolisms. 55% of our energy is recommended to come from carbs. There are some guidelines, um, uh, I think the American and the NICE guidelines, which suggest you don't actually need uh, to use 55% carbs, and it does say that you can reduce the carbohydrate amount if that would help uh, to get your HbA1c down. So there's a little bit of leeway there for us. You know, it's a bit of a rough, rough time, isn't it, for us type 1s? Um, because uh, this, this was 1997. It, there's lots of hormones come in since then. You know, it's been, been discovered since then. That, that, you know, there's ghrelin, there's adiponectin, loads of them. But there's 22 um, other things on that list, other than glucose, that affect insulin, metab insulin expression and secretion. And it goes from, on the right-hand side, all, all the nerves of the parasympathetic nervous system, and that will go to the brain as well. Um, and, of course, you may be able to help mod mod modulate that with, with stress reduction. You've got, in the sort of central bit in the middle there, you've got all of your gastric hormones. Um, you may be able to manage those in, in different ways. I mean, fasting is, a, is an excellent way of suppressing uh, the, these hormones, and then you've got things like steroids and, and adrenaline and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Galanin. Anybody know what galanin does? Me neither, but it does something. It, <laughs> it, it, a Wikipedia uh, entry would suggest it increases ga um, ga gamma aminobuteric acid, the, the neurotransmitter, and, and lots of those do, so does neuropeptide Y. So there's a lot of interaction between the gut and, and, and the, the nervous system, isn't there? So we've got this cocktail of drugs and nerves and, and, and foods like protein, and we're just focusing on glucose. And I know that makes a huge difference, but what happens when you draw the glucose out and, and stop eating the glucose? You'll still be producing it, as Trudy said, you'll be producing it. Um, but you've got, when you start to strip away the carb, you start to see other things happening. Um, we know, don't we? I mean, sorry about this slide, it's awful. It's meant to be sort of red and green, but, it, uh, but it basically we, we know that people uh, with type 1 get metabolic syndrome and, and they get a lot of insulin resistance, and, and Trudy's talked about that a lot. Um, you know, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in di diabetes, and a lot of people have, have, have latched onto that and said, right, we better actually hammer down the cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, and don't worry too much about the, di about the diabetes because we need to manage the, the secondary risk factors. And, and this group in Spain uh, called for new therapeutic strategies required. And I think a lot of that was re um, revolving around therapeutics, but at, at, at pharmaceuticals. But I think there are other ways of doing it, as we've talked about. And I don't know whether this is insulin resistance in type 1, but uh, everyone who has type 1 diabetes knows that throughout every day you will have difficulty sometimes in controlling your blood glucose, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the amount of insulin that's in your body. 
So you could technically call it insulin resistance. And we know that the, the dawn phenomenon, when your, your growth hormone pulses through the night, suppress the expression of insulin, you, you, get, uh, you get a raised glucose. We know that stress raises your glucose levels. Intense physical activity, as, as one of you just mentioned there. Um, food, amazing. Caffeine, um, saturated fat, um, eating at the wrong time of day, snacking. They all make diabetes very difficult to control. Um, if, if you're a woman of childbearing age, periods make a massive difference. So one week every four weeks, you're probably going to be in an insulin resistant state, which will need managing, and it's rarely talked about. Um, too much insulin, I think that contributes as well, but I think that contributes more to the, to the longer term insulin resistance problems. I'm just going to show you a couple of my traces here. Um, this is obviously a ketogenic diet. This is a fasted 24-hour sample, but it's not exactly fasted for 24 hours because it's about 1,800, there's some food taken. But what I'm trying to say is throughout the night, nothing much is going on. Um, as soon as you wake up, uh, that little gap is a, is a correction sort of capillary test. It kicks up the glucose. Now, that is, is stress. That's a stress reaction. As Trudy was saying, cortisol was released in the morning. And so... so You've got to, at that stage, at the top of that peak, which is about eight, nine, something like that, you've got to make a decision what you're going to do. Because you've already injected your long-acting insulin to start the morning, and, and long-acting insulin should always be used twice a day, in my view, even the, even the ultra-modern ones, the, the, the receiver and things. Uh, and you've got to decide what you're going to do. Is that going to carry on going up? Have you got enough insulin on board? Who knows? Are you going into ketosis? If you measure it in an hour, will it be 15? Difficult to know, so it's decision time, because you haven't got the benefit of the rest of that. So at this point, we're at the top of that graph, four units of insulin were injected. Now, four units of insulin, each unit drops your blood glucose. It's different in everyone, but about two to three. So that would probably drop the blood glucose by 12 millimoles per litre, with a, a starting glucose of eight. <laughs> so nothing happened. Glucose, the, the glucose levels went straight back up again. That little white bar in the middle of that plateau is a, another, a, another capillary check. Well, what's going on? Is my meter playing up? You know, is my sensor playing up? No, it wasn't. So three hours after that injection, a little bit of insulin stacking coming on here, injecting more than once in a five-hour period. Another four units go in, just out of frustration. Um, you know, terrible management. I'm not advocating anybody does this, but it just goes to show. And then it went back up even higher than before. And then... It corrected itself, and in this situation, it was, it was light exercise, nothing more than that. It wasn't a dedicated run or anything. And then food and blah de blah de blah And the next day, oh, so eight unnecessary units of insulin were added to that. If you hadn't injected that insulin, you might have peaked at probably 11, 12, and that would have carried on, but would have sorted itself out. So we've just put in eight unnecessary units of insulin, which need to be metabolized somewhere. That's the next day and that's one you put on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and apart from that little red bit, you just get rid of that. Um, and, and that shows, this is quite an interesting graph. So from midnight to about six, that's probably a bit of growth hormone kicking in there with the, with the dawn phenomenon. And then that little drop down is a couple of units just to correct the potential of stress. And then those two little bumps there are food, two, twice a day, eating that day. And then nothing else went on and just sorted itself out throughout the night. But is this simply insulin carbs and glucose, is that what, we don't know what the insulin level is to maintain that flat graph. Everybody says, oh, bless you, well done, that's really good. But is it? We, I, nobody knows. And I think to know, you'd need to test the plasma insulin levels at some point. Because this is a graph I've shown before, but it's the one on the right you need to look at. It's the black dots on the right. That shows the insulin levels of someone asleep with type 1 diabetes. And these, this group of, I think it was about 30 people, they had sort of what I call average diabetes. You know, they, they had an HbA1c of 7.5 or 53, I think that comes out to. And they um, had no complications. And they were in their 20s and 30s. And they were injecting, I think it was once daily insulin. And you can see that the plasma insulin levels, the peripheral insulin levels are higher than the white bars, which are people who don't have diabetes. And these people were reasonably well controlled. Look, this is the glucose on the left, and if you look at the black dots for glucose, between six and seven all night. It's not showing any relationship to the insulin, <laughs> but it's stable throughout the night. 
So these people who were considered reasonably well controlled have habitually higher plasma insulin levels. And I think higher plasma insulin levels might be causing problems. And over years and years and years of injecting too much insulin, you're going to end up with this. This is a patient I saw about a couple of weeks ago, I, I'd imagine. He's a 55-year-old man with type 1 diabetes since the age of about 10. Uh, he was just, he'd just come back from his clinic. He hadn't come to see me about his diabetes, but I, I asked him if he'd known of Richard Bernstein. He's hopefully I put that seed in anyway. But he's on, you know, a generous estimation. He's on over... Uh, uh, 40, uh, 70, 150 units, 100 units a day, 150 units a day of insulin. Now, a person who doesn't have diabetes needs about 20 to 40 units of insulin to maintain normal blood glucose. Huge amount of insulin. Not only that, the bottom three or four drugs there that suggest he's had a heart attack, he's been treated with that, massive doses of statins. He's on sertraline, which is an antidepressant, he's on a huge dose of sertraline. And he's got, obviously, erectile dysfunction because he's on testosterone gel. I wonder if that's anything to do with the atorvastatin blocking the expression of testosterone. And he's also on tramadol for back pain, etc., etc. So I think we need, in type 1 diabetes, to actively start looking for insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. And there's lots of tests you can do. It's, two, it's simple blood tests measuring insulin and glucose only, and then you get a little calculator and you can measure insulin resistance. I think we need to start looking for markers of inflammation and the cytokines, the interleukins, the thromboxanes, and all that sort of thing. I think we probably ought to start considering having uh, coronary artery calcium scans in, in our patients with type 1. You know, we're quite happy to slap them on statins for the rest of their life, and God knows what that does to them. But why not find out if they're vulnerable? I mean, what's the problem, really? And, and I think we should be looking for something called coefficient of variability in, in glucose control for type 1s, which basically means how many peaks and troughs have you had and how far from the mean is that, essentially, but I'm sure some mathematicians will be able to correct that. But that, that comes as a percentage, and that gives a much more accurate idea of, of what the glucose control is. And HbO1c is just an average mean, taking all those peaks and troughs into, into um, consideration. I just want to talk a little bit about insulin, because it is a double-edged sword, really. It, it, it's life-saving, but it is possibly also a bit dangerous. So that's uh, six insulin molecules, and that's how it exists in the, in the, in the cell, um, of the beta cell. And it's stuck around that little purple ball there, which, which is um, zinc. And when it's released, and of course it's released in a two-phase fashion, and it's pulsatile, it's nothing like release into the, in the, under the skin, uh, and it separates out into two units of insulin and, and one unit of insulin. That's relatively unreactive. That's getting more reactive all the time. And, of course, we use that um, separation of insulin. We'd also tweak the um, amino acids on the protein of the hormone to give different profiles of, um, of action. So you've got your ultra-rapid acting insulins on the left, and then... This yellow uh, is, is the longer-acting basal, uh, like, yeah. I mean, that doesn't work like that, but it's close. It's meant to be 24 hours, isn't it? So we can tweak insulin to, to suit our needs. And then we're hoping to get that sort of profile. This is a three, meal, three meals a day profile. But if you look at that, the, the, the insulin levels, the blue lines, they go up to about 300 picomoles per litre. And, and the fasting right over that side is less than 50. And you get very narrow, uh, very narrow time responses. So within an hour, the insulin's all used up. And then we get these minds bigger than yours adverts. Um, uh, this, is, this is showing the profiles. This is an ultra-fast insulin. Uh, FIASP is the latest one. Everyone's talking about FIASP. So it must make a lot of money for the company. Mine's twice as fast as yours. Does it really matter? Two and a half minutes to inject. This is an insulin that is designed for fast carbs. So this is pandering to the refined carbohydrate crowd. Have a donut. Stick that in. It will probably catch, catch it at some point. If you look at the dose there, the, the 600, that's getting up to highly insulin resistant levels. And to get that separation, they had to inject right at the top 0.2 units per kilogram. So if you're a 100 kilogram person, you're injecting 20 units for a meal. And if you have type 1 diabetes, you'll know that's a big dose. And, and um, it's a bit mischievous, that. It's a bit misleading. But, you know. So if you look at the slope on the right, that's what I'm interested in, because it doesn't mimic anything like the slope of those three meals, which come straight down. 
So my question is, is what is happening to that insulin that is at higher concentration? What is happening to the insulin? It, it's there. Oh, it's hyperinsulinemia. But where does it go? What happens to it? Well, it gets degraded. But how does it get degraded? And this is a little bit controversial, so if anybody can chip in, it'd be great. So it's degraded in the main by something called insulin-degrading enzyme. Now, insulin-degrading enzyme became very uh, intensively investigated when they looked like there might be some money in Alzheimer's disease, because insulin-degrading enzyme is a badly named uh, insulin uh, it, it, enzyme. It will degrade glucagon, it will degrade amylin, it will degrade amyloid fibres as well, which are thought to be um, part of the problem with Alzheimer's disease. So it's a, it's a, you know, it chews everything up. It lives inside the cell, as far as I'm aware, and when insulin is used up on, on the glute receptors, it gets drawn into the cell and gets chopped up. So in a normal person with no diabetes, you know, just say that's the cell membrane and it's all, all the vehicles which is insulin coming through. Right at the bottom here, near that vent, you've got insulin degrading enzyme chopping it all up. And it, it doesn't really matter what you've got. I know there are two Honda Civics, but one's a red one, one's a white one. But as long as it will fit in that claw, it'll take anything. So as I say, it'll take glucagon, it'll take, it'll take what you like. Uh, so what happens when everything gets overwhelmed? What happens when you get insulin resistance, where your body's less sensitive to insulin? You get a bank holiday, don't you? Uh, we're all <laughs> so if that's the bloodstream, you know, and that's the inside of the cell, nothing can get in. So I just wonder what is happening to that insulin. That's hyperinsulinemia, and it's causing all sorts of metabolic problems within the cell itself, within the cell itself, and, and inflammation, whatever. But I'm just wondering if it's it, it, itself starting to form amyloid. We know that insulin can aggregate into clumps of sheets, which are relatively unreactive, like the one on the, on the right. And we also know that amyloid is present in people who have um, end-stage diabetes because you can find it in the pancreas. And we also know that it's named after amylin, which is the hormone that is co-secreted with insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas when someone uh, eats glucose. And amylin's job is to go to the stomach and try to stop any more glucose coming in. And it's also there to try to satiate you to say, I don't want any more, thank you very much. And we know that amylin, uh, amyloid-type proteins are implicated in Alzheimer's disease. I'm not saying that, obviously, you're going to get Alzheimer's of the arm or anything like that. And we know that insulin-degrading enzyme has the ability to degrade amyloid. So this is contentious, but I'm just trying to put that across. There might be somebody out there who might be able to help. Amyloid is mostly soluble, and we know that people who inject insulin into the same site time and time again will develop amyloid in that site. So they don't just get fat hypertrophy, but some people get um, lumps called insulin amyloid. So I think we need a management strategy that is sympathetic to lower carbohydrate diets, which therefore do not require larger doses of insulin to go in. I think it's quite important, and I think it therefore means that we have to change our dietary approach to type 1 diabetes for the 96% of people who can't hack it, not because of their own fault, but because the metabolism just doesn't work well enough for them. We can't just keep crossing our fingers and hoping for the best and berating people for not doing very well. Um, so I think, bearing in mind we don't know what the complication rate's going to be and how many complications people are going to get, I think it's important that people should be made aware of, of what their options are. And I think low carb should be a, a, an option for people with type 1 diabetes so they can decide for themselves. You can't say, hang on a minute, hang on for another 20 years while we've got the answer. Because logically, you'd think most people on a low carb diet will inject roughly half the amount of insulin they were previously injecting. Most people will drill their HbA1c down to near normal levels. So you can only start to think, well, they're the sort of conditions that we want to create to, to give us any chance of, of longevity with no complications. And I really do think that we must all have CGMs. These will measure the coefficient of variation. This is the tool that's combined with information on low carb that is going to revolutionize type 1 diabetes. Give people a, a meter, like everyone's said here, get a meter, he's talking about it, uh, Pete, um, and they'll find out for themselves what carbs do and what low carbs do, and they'll be able to monitor their own insulin accordingly. And that's got to stop, hasn't it? This is just unforgivable. I mean, I'm sure most of you have seen that. The first meal of a 10-year-old boy. Um, I mean, it's not, even, it's not even real food. I mean, that, that is the, the, the thing, isn't it? The only good thing about that, I mean, they, they've got so much confidence they've left his cannula in. You know, 
just woken him up from a diabetic coma, saved his life. I mean, fantastic technological achievement to save someone's life, isn't it? And then you give him that. And the only good thing about it, he hasn't eaten it yet. You, know, you, you just want to go and grab it, don't you, and save the poor chap. Because what we're going to do in 40 years' time, he was as old as... He's, he was the same age as that gentleman I said earlier. And that is preventable. You know, it's awful, isn't it? So they're the resources we have <coughs> at the moment for people to try to make their own minds up on. I'll leave that up. Um, there's David Cavan, who's a consultant diabetologist. Um, there's him with Emma Porter, who's a type 1 herself. She's uh, told me I can say that. And she's a, a busy type 1 mum who's written an excellent book for low carb, for both type 1s and type 2s. So there's a bit of carbs in that. Is Adam Brown. Some of you may have bought his book. Great guy. There's a lot of mindfulness stuff in there. There's, of course, there's the Bible, Richard Bernstein. He's a medical doctor. There's um, Keith Runyon and Ellen Davis. Keith Runyon is a, is a nephrologist, a kidney doctor in the States. And he had type 1, and he's low carb. There's type 1 low carb UK, which is the equivalent of type 1 grit, uh, which is uh, on the other side there, which is a low carb Facebook forum. For, for anyone who wants to learn about low carb. And then there's the diabetes digital media uh, type 1 program, which I hope you'll all be seeing soon and um, will be the, the, the gold standard for <laughs> diabetes management in the future. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>